this probably, uh, this is really honour to be here, this is probably the, the best audience for me to present a paper like this to. Uh, the paper uh, I'm going to present to you today, I'm sort of taking advantage of the fact that I've got an audience that's sort of specialist in electoral integrity to so present something that really is in the process of being written. So this paper is, was originally part of uh, a larger paper, and I decided the larger paper was really too big, and so I've sort of taken out this little chunk of this paper and I'm developing it. I'm going to be doing some slightly different things with it in perfect than what I did in the larger paper. Um, and uh, I've been working on it the last uh, several weeks when I've been in, in Canberra, mainly developing the theoretical side of it, because I haven't really had the opportunity to develop the, the, the empirical side of it too much. And so the empirical analysis I put in here is kind of like almost a placeholder. So I'm, I'm developing a, a larger data set to, to test this theory on. But um, I'm really be interested in hearing what you have to say um, about the, the basic ideas that I'm trying to put forward here. Um, the paper, as it's uh, the, the title is The Evolution of Electoral uh, Integrity and Competitive Authoritarian Regime. The paper is really actually a paper about uh, protests and why post electoral protests occur, why people protest after elections. Um, and the basic argument is that electoral protests are, are more common than, than they used to be, and, they are, and I'll go to the reasons why I think this might be the case. Um, and that, as we know from, from other literature, electoral process, protests are one of the main drivers of electoral reform. And, and the other bit of the paper that this used to be part of kind of demonstrates that late, and so it looks at um, the extent to which protests bring about electoral reform. But this paper doesn't go, go into that as such, it just looks at what causes protests. But we, we know from other literature that um, in, in the contemporary era, at least, uh, post April protests are one of the main factors that, that bring, tends to bring about electoral reform under the right circumstances. And so then the question is, given that you know, the more electoral protests than they used to be, they are um, you know, having an, an impact on electoral integrity in a lot of contexts, so it's interesting to, to work out why it is that protests might occur and when we would expect to see protests. So that's what I'm, I'm trying to look at right here. And, and the main argument of the paper is that protests tend to take place following a decline in uh, electoral integrity for reasons that um, I'll go into. Um, they don't just take place following you know, fraudulent elections, they can take place following elections that were more fraudulent than, than the previous ones, and that's the basic gist of the argument. And the implication of this is that elections often have to get worse before they get better, a process that I describe as the electoral tango. So one step back, two steps forward. Um, mm -hmm after Lenin, who used that concept in a slightly different context. Um, right, so why is it that we see more post-electoral protests now than perhaps we did um, in previous generations? I, I think we can understand the rise of post-electoral protests in terms of what I've labeled three waves of electoral reform that have uh, occurred over the, 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 the modern history of uh, elections to representative institutions. And the first wave of electoral reform that we can identify is all the big struggles about the franchise that took place um, starting uh, in the, the 18th century and going all the way up until the 20th century, depending on the time we have until uh, women got franchised in, in, uh, in Switzerland in 1974. So all the big struggles over who is allowed to vote, and these, were the, these I think, were the, were the main struggles over the course of modern electoral history, was, was, was who was allowed to be included in the franchise. Um, and certainly in, in most of the countries that are contemporary established democracies, these were the big struggles that led to democratization and so forth, Huntington so forth, first wave of democratization. Um, and the second main uh, wave of electoral reform was, was struggles over uh, which parties were allowed to compete. So um, by sometime in, in the 20th century, virtually all states that held uh, elections to representative institutions, or most of them at least, had, uh, were, were conducting elections on the basis of universal franchise, even so the Soviet Union and other uh, states that we don't consider very democratic when they held elections to, to direct elections to national representative institutions, they held them on the basis of a universal franchise. Um, in the, the latter half of the, the latter part of the 20th century. Uh, but a lot of, of states were still restricting political competition in the sense that they were restricting who was allowed to compete, either through formal bans on, um, uh, on uh, parties that weren't the, the dominant party, as, as was the case in many communist states, or on, on de facto 
balance of, of certain parties, um, the representative major sectors of the electorate. So a lot of the states um, going into the so-called third wave of democratization, the Huntington identifies, uh, were, were conducting uh, elections on the basis of universal franchise, but uh, limited uh, uh, partisan competition. In many cases, uh, they didn't really have multi-party uh, elections. And the third wave, Huntington's third wave of democratization was basically, in many contexts, to simplify hugely, was basically about um, enabling more parties to compete. I mean, there weren't too many cases of suffrage expansion, South Africa being the main exception, um, but this is mainly about allowing more parties into the political arena. So, um, once the, the third wave had, had sort of more or less got off the ground, you had a situation where pretty much all of the citizenry was included in the franchise, and pretty much uh, most states that were conducting elections were conducting them on, on the basis of uh, multi-party competition. And, and so the problem no longer lay for elections, and no longer lies for, for elections in most contexts of uh, states that conduct elections that are somehow problematic. But the problem doesn't a lot. Uh, uh, lie in the formal institutions, the formal rights around the election. The problem, in most cases now, the types of states that we study, the types of elections we tend to study, uh, is, is the fact that the, the formal rights are not implemented in a fair way. It's not a level playing field. Um, it's, it's the implementation of the rights that are problematic, not so much the rights themselves. The rights themselves tend to be guaranteed in most contexts, uh, but they're not implemented in an impartial manner. Um, and that is the situation where we've been in, I think, around about since the turn of the century, a situation where in most states that conduct elections are doing so on the basis of multi party competition and the universal franchise, but uh, they manipulate electoral institutions. So you form rights granted and then they're taken away uh, when the elections are um, conducted and that the reform rights are undermined, the institutions are undermined. Um, and so uh, struggles over electoral institutions, therefore, in this day and age, tend to be more about the implementation of rights and less about the formal rights themselves. Okay, so this is where the, sort of the current terrain of struggles over electoral reform and struggles over elections tends to be. It's about how um, formal electoral rights are, are, are in practice uh, undermined or abused in the electoral process and what might be done in the way of uh, reform to the electoral system to prevent that from happening. Um, and this means that there's been another way of thinking about this is that there's been a, a shift um, since the, you know, the basic uh, extension of formal rights in most contexts. There's been a, a gradual shift from exclusion to bias. People aren't groups, parties, and voters aren't so much excluded anymore. Obviously, there are contexts where people, um, or parties, candidates are excluded in practice, but on paper, at least, uh, there aren't too many states that actually formally. Uh, exclude um, candidates from, from standing or voting, voters from voting, but it tends to be sometimes uh, the case that, that when it comes to it, that some technicality is, is used by electoral authorities to ban a particular candidate from standing, or pressure is put on voters not to go and vote, or other, in other ways people are, are preventing from exercising their rights, or they do exercise their rights, but somehow the result is manipulated in such a way that um, the, the result of the election doesn't reflect um, how people voted. And I think this shift has important implications for how mass publics react to electoral abuse. It's what they're acting to is not simply the fact that they haven't got the rights. They have got the rights, and then those rights are, are taken away. And so they're given something, and it's taken away. And people don't tend to like when they're given something, it's taken away. They tend to be loss of us. They tend to not like um, having things taken from them. Uh, and so, People have these rights, and then their rights are episodically infringed. Right? At the time of this election, everybody's rights um, are infringed, and they're all infringed at the same time. And so they all, therefore, have grounds to have a grievance at the same time. Um, and this, I think, is one of the um, factors that sets the scene for mass mobilization against electoral malpractice. When you have a situation where people don't have the rights to begin with, an election takes place, and probably not that interested in the election, they, they probably, oh well, you know. Um, yes, of course, we have to super long and vote for you know, the main party, but this is a really meaningful process, but there's, there's not really a sense in which they um, they, they feel, uh, they have grounds for feeling that something has been given to them and taken away, whereas if, if they, they are the, the, the grounds for feeling that, they're more likely to feel grieved. Um, 
But there are other factors, obviously, that have also contributed to the rise of post-electoral protests, technical advance advances, um, obviously, sort of the rise of the internet, social media, mobile telephones, satellite TV, have all enhanced the ability of groups to find out relevant information about uh, what's happened in elections and also to, to mobilize and to, you know, to engage in collective action. That's definitely been a factor. Um, although virtually all uh, in the history of, of contentious politics shows that virtually all um, uh, new developments in contentious politics have been associated with some kind of technological change that's, that's facilitated that. But uh, in addition to technological change that facilitates contentious politics, obviously you need a driver as well. Um, another uh, factor that facilitates or gives an, an incentive to people to engage in um, post-electoral protests is the fact that the international community is much more attentive these days to electoral processes than was the case, say, a generation ago. There are more um, international actors who are sort of looking, watching elections to see how democratic they might be, perhaps sending monitors, more international election observation missions. Um, and so this provides an incentive for groups to publicize the fact that there are problems, if there are problems. Um, and this then provides an incentive for groups to mobilize. But still, they need, they need a reason to get out there on, on the streets. They're not just going to protest simply because there might be an, an attentive um, international community. So I think these other explanations don't fully account for why there might be um, a rise, there might have been a rise of post social protests. Now, to look at the sort of overall headline uh, results and to, to measure electoral protests. I'm, I'm using, for the purpose of this analysis, um, the NELDA um, indicator, NELDA 29 from Susan Hyde, Nikolai Marinoff's data center, I'm sure you're most familiar with, um, as to whether there were riots and protests after the election. And the notes on NELDA 29 indicate that the riots and the protests have to be related somehow to the election. So we're not just talking about bread riots, we're talking about electoral a rise that are linked to elections, a protest of some kind that are linked to elections. So that's my indicator I'm using. And it just graphs this indicator over time. You see that there's been a, a, a clear rise in, in post electoral protests that coincides with uh, the third wave of democratization. This, this is when states are getting their um, uh, the multi party political competition is, is um, becoming entrenched. In, formal rights of the political system in most states at the time of the third wave of democratization of the 1980s. You see that sort of this, uh, rise in post electoral protests. Um, when I get back home and get back to my software that I normally use, I'll be able to graph this as a proportion of all elections, because obviously the number of elections that have taken place have increased over this time as well, and I appreciate that simply trolling protests rather than uh, uh, the absolute number rather than this proportion is so it doesn't fully account for it, but I believe that I will also find, hoping I will also find there's an, an increase even if you look at it as a, as a proportion of water um, Now, um, where I sort of started um, with protests is I was reading the, the literature on, on the color revolutions um, in Eastern Europe, uh, that is the literature that has talked about post-structural protests probably the most in recent years at least. And um, the, uh, some of this literature, at least, the, 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 the studies that I found most useful for, for why I'm developing this argument are the studies that link post electoral protests uh, to um, the collective action problems. So, Bunce and, Bunce and Wolchek and Kuntz and Thompson and Tucker in particular talk about protests, post electoral protests, as being facilitated by the fact that electoral fraud provides a spark or a trigger that enables voters to overcome the collective action problem, which besets them in any context, and to get them out on the street because they, um, as I said before, the, the fraud is, it happens to everyone at the same time. Um, it's something that people feel aggrieved about, um, and uh, it, it is a, a measurable, um, very often if the election monitors there, it's something that, that can be measured and something that can, um, uh, to get them all, get them all mobilized at the same time. And, and, and I think this is a powerful argument. The problem with this argument is that um, most fraud doesn't spark protest. Okay, we have um, the Nelda data set. Um, there are 417 protests out of 2,974 elections. Um, and that um, uh, is only about 14%. And we know uh, that um, almost all elections have some problems associated with them. 
uh, you know, you take even uh, elections in democratic states, they usually have some problem. Somebody feels aggrieved about something that's gone wrong, some ballots are lost, or some, some postal vote fraud. And certainly we know from survey evidence that there is a substantial minority of populations, even in the most democratic states, that think the elections are not free and fair. Um, and so, you know, there's a group of people out there, even in the most democratic context, that thinks that something's gone wrong with the election. And certainly in less democratic context, there tend to be lots of people out there who think that there's something gone wrong with the election. So why don't they get that out of the streets of protest? And um, so I think this argument that fraud sparks protest um, is, is not complete, because I, I think it doesn't account for the fact that it's so rare that fraud does spot protest. And so, um, my um, sort of the, the contribution I'm hoping to make uh, with this paper is that you're much more likely to have protests if there's been a worsening of the quality of the elections, a worsening of electoral integrity, um, or uh, more electoral malpractice. Um, it's in that context when things uh, have got worse that people feel even more aggrieved. Because not only do they have rights that are taken away, but they've had those rights have been implemented um, reasonably well, perhaps, uh, and then uh, the quality of elections goes down. So they feel doubly aggrieved, having formal rights that aren't fully implemented, but having formal rights that were better implemented before and uh, or worse implemented. And um, we can see why this might be the case by looking at the literature on contentious politics. So I sort of went back to some of the earlier literature on contentious politics, starting with Ted Robert Goode's Why Men Rebel. And the main point that he makes, uh, I think is relevant for this argument, is that deprivation in steady state doesn't cause people to rebel. The classic case would be sort of poor peasants, dirt poor, can live for years and years without really rebelling against their poverty. It's when there's an increase in people's expectations relative to their experience, uh, they feel they experience relative deprivation and that's when they rebel. Um, and so you can see this in, uh, you can think about this in the, in the electoral context, Go mainly looks at economic uh, deprivation, although he also does consider political deprivation, but his argument is that um, it, what drives the rebellions he's looking at is mainly economic deprivation. But if you consider it in terms of political deprivation, you can say, well, a, a country goes through democratization process, things get better, expectations get raised, and then there is um, you know, the elections start to be manipulated, the, wrong, the elections don't ever become fully free and fair, uh, and then perhaps things get worse, so um, people's, there's a, a growing discrepancy between people's expectation and what they experience, and it's when this um, expectation uh, diverges from experience that you tend to get a sense of relative political deprivation, and that's when people tend to be more likely to be available for mobilization against um, electoral malpractice. And also this basic idea, although a lot of people have criticized Go on, on, on the grounds that his argument doesn't really address a number of aspects of the, of the, the collective action problem and other factors aren't taken into consideration. Uh, he actually makes an individual level argument, but he uses aggregate level data to test it. So there are lots of problems with Go's argument. But um, uh, most of the people who have developed other uh, arguments uh, since then about contentious problems, uh, politics have retained this idea that tent, uh, contentious politics, an episode of contentious politics, tends to be sparked by some kind of change um, that brings about, changes the opportunity structure, changes the incentives in which people are operating, um, and spurs them to, uh, to, to protest. So, uh, when things are in steady state, people don't tend to protest. It's when there's some kind of change that makes them feel more aggrieved that they tend to get out there and protest. So, drawing on this insight, um, we can um, argue that uh, electoral malpractice um, both provides an incentive for people to protest because it, it gives them uh, a grievance, so electoral malpractice gets worse and they have more of an incentive to protest, and also drawing on the, the literature. Um, from the, the color revolution literature, we, we, we know that the, uh, electoral fraud provides a useful coordinating device. Um, everyone feels agreed at the same time. Uh, the, uh, the, the grievance is usually demonstrated with, with evidence that people have. Um, it is a point of, um, of weakness of, of the, the authorities if they're obliged to engage in, um, in uh, increased electoral malpractice to, to win the election. 
and so this sort of episodic ritualized nature of elections uh, provides a fertile ground for the development of, of repertoires of contentious politics. And we see this very clearly if you look at some of the colored revolutions. Um, when they got out there on the streets and were demonstrating against uh, electoral fraud in Serbia or Georgia or Ukraine, it wasn't the first time. They had been out there on the streets before. There were well-developed repertoires of contentious politics in all of those, all of the, all of those states. And um, they, oh, they had the, the, the repertoires of contentious politics they had were always focused on elections. And they had, in some cases, demonstrating against other things, communism subsequently. Um, leaders that they, they weren't very happy with, uh, but they, they were very well developed uh, repertoires of contentious politics that were then adapted um, and applied specifically to uh, elections. Uh, and so this sort of the episodic nature of, of elections, the ritualized and predictable nature of elections, like you know what's going to happen when, um, and the collective nature of elections, everyone votes at the same time and they all have their votes um, uh, basically uh, undermined by undemocratic elections at the same time. Um, provides the, the sort of trigger. So a refined version of the argument then is that the formal granting of electoral rights um, and then the undermining, biasing, uh, through, uh, through or undermining electoral rights through biased electoral procedures creates the kind of basic preconditions, the incentives for mass mobilization against electoral fraud. But it doesn't create the sort of trigger. Um, and it's the worsening of electoral abuse that provides the trigger that enables people to overcome their collective action problem. Um, and get out there on, on the streets. So that's sort of drawing on both the, the, the literature on um, elections and the literature on contentious action. We put these two things together, that's what I've come up with. Um, now, what I'm in the process of doing, and what I will um, be able to do when I get back to the UK, uh, is to develop a global uh, data set on election quality and, and be able to test this kind of on a, on a global data set going back probably to around 1980, um, looking at elections in. Um, Competitive authoritarian states, so I'm still not exactly sure if I can you know, define my elections by looking at. I might start with all, all of the elections that have taken place. Um, and then uh, working out uh, uh, you know, whether or not um, it is more likely that you have uh, a, a protest following a worsening of um, electoral conduct. Uh, but for the purpose of this paper, because I um, don't, I'm not really able to, to develop that data set. Uh, while I've been here in Australia, I've just uh, fought back on my uh, index of electoral malpractice, which is a data set based on uh, coded election observation reports that I put together um, a number of years ago. And that uh, data set covers uh, elections in Central and Eastern Europe, the former Soviet Union, Sub Saharan Africa, and Latin America between 1995 and 2007. So it's um, 161 elections, so 155 elections in 61 states. Um, and I've used that just to provide a preliminary test of the argument. And um, so the elections are national level elections to so the, the executive and the lower chamber of parliament in the first round only um, in those states. So not a huge N, but um, especially since there's some missing data on some of the other variables I've used, but enough to give a feel of, of whether there's something in this argument. And um, so I've done a, a quick and dirty regression analysis, including a number of um, independent variables that the contentious politics literature predicts ought to be relevant for any episode of contentious uh, politics, so resources, opportunities, constraints, and, and international factors, and found that um, indeed the, the decline in election quality is previous election measured by my um, index of electoral practice uh, variable. Uh, is associated with a uh, greater propensity to, uh, for, for those more likely that, that, that there will be a protest. So that's sort of where I am now. I'm hoping, as I said, uh, very soon to be testing this on a larger data set. Um, but I think if this implication does hold, um, and it is the case that elections often have to get worse before they get better, uh, the sort of electoral tango phenomenon, then this has a number of um, Implications, firstly, for our understanding of electoral authoritarianism and uh, electoral integrity, that as I'm sure you all know, there's been debate in the literature as to whether elections held in uh, authoritarian contexts uh, actually help or hinder democracy. And there's some Lindbergh, some Lindbergh and, and colleagues who argue that just the mere holding of elections in the context of uh, an electoral uh, authoritarian setting. Uh, makes it more likely eventually there will be an episode of democratization, whereas um, other people criticize this and say, well, no, actually, elections are a tool uh, 
that helps maintain the flow of tone is with many contexts that a flow of tone leader has managed to uh, use elections um, as a means of distributing patronage, collecting information about our opponents, and, and basically uh, a tool for staying in power. Um, and that, uh, therefore, uh, elections in an electoral authoritarian context hinder democratization, or the prospect of democratization. Um, but I think my argument kind of cuts across that and says that, uh, in fact, elections do both, that the uh, authoritarian leaders are often successful in using fraud to stay in power, but ultimately, um, this uh, has the tendency for, for this uh, use of fraud to undermine the, the, the prospects of staying in power because it's likely eventually if the fraud gets ramped up, as it often does when, when leaders become weakened in some respect, or the strategies they've been using become less successful, then um, the, the strategy will, will backfire and it's likely that there will be some kind of protest that will oblige them to make concessions. Um, and so that's sort of the the takeaway for, for the literature on electoral integrity. Um, I think there are also implications, uh, if this finding holds the implications for electoral systems, um, if it is the case that elections will have to get worse before they get better, then it would make sense for electoral systems providers to focus their attention on the pro-reform movement and civil society movements um, more than on working with election management bodies and so forth. Um, as a protest is the motive for reform and change, then uh, it makes sense to, to work with people who might potentially mount a successful protest. And obviously, electoral system providers do do this. Um, but uh, I would argue that uh, it makes uh, sense to channel more of the resources in this direction and few of the resources um, towards um, helping EMBs to kind of cover up all the fraud they're engaging in, which sometimes I think is, is what some electoral system providers do. So um, I'm hoping. Uh, that you will uh, be able to, to guide me in the further development of